To most Americans, the rise of the protest movement among white youth came as a complete surprise. For most of the century, colleges had been a conservative institutions that drew their students from a privileged segment of the population. In fact, during the 1950s, young people had even been called the silent generation. What made this new left and later evolved into the counterculture movement was its rejection of the intellectual and political categories that had reshaped radicalism and liberalism for most of the 20th century. It challenged not only mainstream America, but what it dismissively called the old left. Beginning in the years 16, 1962 and 1963, the country witnessed the appearance of several path-breaking books that first challenged notions of the old left as well as American democracy. Some of these included James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, which gave an angry voice to the Black Power Revolution, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which exposed the environmental cost of economic growth, and Michael Harrington's The Other America, which revealed the persistence of poverty among a culture of plenty. The Students for a Democratic Society, the SDS, also formed initially as an offshoot of the Socialist League for Industrial Democracy. Meeting at Port Huron in Michigan, about 60 college students adopted a document that captured the mood and summarized the beliefs of this generation of student protesters. This document was called the Port Huron Statement and devoted most of its text to criticism of institutions from political parties to corporations, even unions, and the military industrial complex. They were anti-establishment. Some of the 1950s influences that led to the counterculture movement are seen in this slide. You've got the Beatniks with Jack Kerouac, um, also illustrated by James Dean, um, and also by the young Elvis. The suburbia movement, women's conformity in the home, and generally the appearance of a white middle-class America. However, as the baby boomers grew into young adults, this mood changes and they adopt this very anti-establishment attitude toward not only the government but also society in general. So it was a direct reaction to the 1950s. And in this period, you see the emergence of the women's movement, the National Organization for Women. You see um, Bob Dylan and Janis Joplin leading a new music revolution. You see communes form, uh, particularly in urban areas and in California. You see a new Native American movement as they sought to have further retribution from the U.S. government. And even things such as the birth control pill, which became um, much more popular and used by not just uh, poor Americans, but by middle and upper class women as well. A lot of this anti-establishment sentiment came from the Vietnam War. It was a war also that young people protested because they didn't want to fight in it. So let's think about each of the president's policies in Vietnam. We know that Eisenhower um, definitely pursued d'entente, which was the um, idea that the United States would do whatever it could politically and economically and if needed militarily to stop the spread of communism. He sent some key advisors to Vietnam. JFK uh, increased the number of quote-unquote advisors uh, and sent in some initial troops, however, they were not there for combat. He also believed in d'entente. And then LBJ, as we know, certainly believed in this policy of containing communism by escalating the Vietnam War. Richard Nixon campaigned on a policy of Vietnamization and promised to end the war in Vietnam. It was the major reason he was elected, although he was also a seasoned politician. But as we know, once Nixon came into office, he actually didn't do what he said. He did draw down troops, but he also attacked Cambodia um, and had some other shady dealings with the countries in Southeast Asia. This, along with Watergate, 
cost him not only, um, or didn't cost him the election, but we know cost him his job um, as soon in the beginning of his second term. So a question to ask yourself, did the attitudes and policies of the United States government regarding the war in Vietnam, or sometimes known as Vietnam, do they reflect the attitudes of the American people during the time of war? It's a famous political cartoon on your right where you've got the soldiers who are the baby boomers who are now young adults um, marching in, as they escalate in Vietnam. Leading, being led blindly in the blindfold symbolizes the government. They're doing what they're being told. Escalate, there is no substitute for victory. But the but the irony of the cartoon is that there is no um, end goal. There is nowhere that these steps lead. And so on the other hand, you have the counterculture movement that reacts and, and feels ashamed of what's happening in Asia and also believes that it's simply none of our business. And so this leads us to the 1968 election. As casualties mounted and American bombs poured down on the North and South in Vietnam, the Cold War foreign policy had begun to unravel. By 1968, the war had sidetracked much of LBJ's great society and had torn apart families, universities, and the Democratic Party. With the entire political leadership, liberal no less than conservative, committed to the war for most of the 1960s, young activists lost all confidence in the system. Opposition for the war became the primary issue for the 1968 election. But remember that I've mentioned 1968 was, in general, an extremely volatile year. A disunited Democratic Party split between the North and the South chose Vice President Herbert, excuse me, Hubert Humphrey as its candidate. He tried to disassociate himself from Johnson's policies and identify himself with more of LBJ's Great Society policies. He was seen as a middle-of-the-road candidate and did have a strong record on civil rights. Richard Nixon was the Republican candidate who made a remarkable political comeback from his defeats, namely in the 1960 presidential election and in 1962 when he lost uh, the California gubernatorial, gubernatorial election as governor. He portrayed himself as a representative of the silent majority. The silent majority is where he believes that America, through its silence, um, is sending the message that they want to end the war. He also promised peace with honor in Vietnam, law and order at home, and smaller government. Then the third party candidate was George C. Wallace of Alabama, who is mostly going to represent the Southern Democrats. He appealed to conservative voters. He denounced uh, enforcing buses of students, um, black students to white high schools, um, black riots, student protests, and anti-war demonstrations. And he didn't, wasn't so worried about the interest of the poor and rather campaigned on law and order. Richard Nixon is going to come out of this election with 43% of the popular vote and the needed um, 270 votes in the Electoral College. So this is a screen that's full of lots of information. All of these are also IDs of yours. But let's just go through them quickly. The New Left, what was it? It was young men and women who were civil rights activists, anti-war activists, um, primarily those are the two main causes, and women's activists as well, let's not forget that, in the 1960s. And they advocated a more radical political belief um, and were, as I mentioned before, very anti-establishment. The Students for Democratic Society, the SDS, um, were founded by um, some white young people in Michigan. They issued the, po the Port, excuse me, that's a typo, the Port Huron Statement, which summarized their political objectives. And they envisioned a new community of people that would end the Vietnam War, secure racial and economic justice, and change the political system. In 1964, the free speech movement um, emerges, and this is a movement for the rights of students to pursue on-campus political activities. This begins in California at the University of California, Berkeley. Protests emerged uh, and were regularly held on campus. Uh, they challenged, the, again, the establishment and, and, and the broader corruption of public policies. Even at Columbia and Harvard in the Northeast, students seized college buildings and violence often ensued. 
Um, these are called teach-ins, um, and this is right down below here. Teach-ins were first organized by faculty and students at the University of Michigan, later spread to other campuses. Many of uh, some of the most notable, the ones that I just listed. And they did sit-ins, much like the civil rights movement, but it, they were there to protest, say that they were there uh, to protest and discuss political, moral, and diplomatic aspects of U.S. involvement in Vietnam and government corruption. The anti-war movement was the New Left's most successful crusade. <clears throat> Although civil rights was still a big issue, especially by 1968, um, things had started with the death of Martin Luther King Jr. Civil rights became more of a, a, a broader war on poverty. What spurred the anti-war movement was really in 1966, where the government ended automatic student deferments. Anyone previously who had been enrolled full-time in college was exempted from the draft. And, uh, and so the government ends this because they need more draftees, and so student activists launched these huge political demonstrations to protest the war. The most famous was the March on the Pentagon in 1967 and the spring mobilization of 1968. And these campus rallies often included draft card um, they, this is where they get the name draft dodgers, but draft card burnings and even flag burnings. Campus recruitment by the military, you know, a lot of military institutions have campus recruitment offices on college campuses. And so they were brought in along with the CIA to um, help keep these um, protests from becoming violent. And college administrators, also, college administrators also used police officers, local police officers, to help keep the peace. Some, some young people even went so far to evade the draft by moving out of the country to Sweden or Canada or accepted jail sentences as a form of disobedience, thinking back to Henry David Thoreau. After President Nixon announced the U.S.-backed invasion of Cambodia in 1970, and once the country realized that, that the plans they believed in place for Vietnam and its withdrawal were not going according to plan. And so a national student strike was organized. This is where you have the two fatal um, incidents that involved the death of several students. The first and the biggest and the most well-known is at Kent State in Ohio, where the National Guard was called in to help control a protest, and they ultimately fired into a crowd of students, killing four and wounding 11. And then later at Jackson State College in Mississippi, two students were killed in a similar situation. By May of 1970, over 40 colleges were closed because of strikes. Overall, this counterculture exhibited dislike for society through an alternative lifestyle, and this then leads them into the music and cultural portion um, that involved long hair and hippies and drug use and permissive sexual behavior. Here are some of the most famous uh, pictures that are coming from the 1968 to 1970 period. You see the teach-ins there. The, probably the most famous picture is this one right here. This is at Kent State. Um, you've got uh, Woodstock, of course. You've got the um, evolution of the term hippies. You see there are people um, being arrested um, in order to avoid the draft. All of this um, just continues to fuel the fire that young people feel about Vietnam, but ultimately about the entire country and the direction that it's headed. So as you think about the counterculture movement, this isn't really assignment, but just think about the ways in which civil disobedience has existed throughout U.S. history. One of the famous phrases for the Woodstock generation was tune in, turn on, or drop out. Meanwhile, Henry David Thoreau, way back in the 1830s, said, If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. Bob Dylan's most famous song, The Times They Are A-Changin', bluntly informed mainstream America. And to be sure, the counterculture in some ways represented not rebellion, but a fulfillment of change. <clears throat> 